welcome to another edition of Why Come Japan. I'm your host, Mr. Rad, Mr. Rad Culture, here on the show where we interview creatives that live in Japan, or outside Japan for that matter, because today's guest is Mr. Ari Bach. I did this interview back in 2016 in Colorado a little while ago. Now, Ari is a good friend of mine. He was a filmmaker in Colorado. We were good friends growing up. And he has a new movie called The Jealous Gods, which is being distributed online. So you can watch it online. I'll put all the information in the links below. And, uh, oh, and also, if you want to support the show for a little bit as a buck a month, you know there's this little button. It's called Patreon. You can push it. And if you go there, you get to see all the, you know... Who you want to see who's coming up next on the show, or if you want to see some of the questions that I asked my guests, or questions that didn't make it to the interview, you can check that all out on the Patreon. Not only that, there's also information about video essays and live streams that'll be doing on the YouTubes. Without further ado, let's jump into the interview. <laughs> Anyway, so I'm here today with Mr. Well, how, how would you like to, you know, refer to yourself online? As? Just Ari. Ari? Okay. Not not Mr. Bach or... Oh, sorry. Was I not supposed to say your name? No, uh, Ari <laughs> I can bleep Bach this is... out if you need me to. No, my full name is fine. I'm Ari Bach. Extraordinaire. <laughs> and most of this podcast is just mostly a conversation between you and me, so don't okay. feel like you have to do those awkward silences. Actually, because my editor was... He was uh, Mr. Andy San... He, uh, he was giving me a lot of shit the other day, like, talking about how awkward these interviews are. So I just say, fuck it, I'm just going to do it very uh, conversation-like. But that means lots of ums and lots of uhs. That means we got to cut out. So uh, hopefully, hopefully he can take care of that. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Andy. All right, okay. So uh, so I guess, uh, Mr. O- why don't you tell us a bit about yourself? Why am I interviewing you today? Um, and you probably said you have no idea, right? I don't know why anybody would want to interview me. No, um, <laughs> I definitely have plenty of things to promote, but uh, I, I've i known you for longer than I've had any of the stuff I'm, I'd be promoting. Um, okay. I guess we met at Tunes. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. I guess a little background. What's Tunes? Tunes was the last independent refuge of videotape rental in Colorado Springs. And uh, it was nice while it lasted. They had all of the movie directors by section. They had all the movies that Blockbuster would never handle. And like everything else, it is no more. Yeah, that's true. We worked with a pretty big lady there, huh? Yeah, Sonia was cool. (laughs) Yeah, Um, and she kind of pushed you around a lot, though. Almost she pushed me around a lot, too. Yeah, she she was like that, but... uh, such as life and work. Such as life. You get worse treatment in L.A.? Far worse. Really? For my time there, yes. Huh. Well, I guess I don't know. I've got, here, this is how I'm going to crowbar the whole Japan angle here. So I, I've mentioned to you in the past, you know, off off camera, of course. Uh, off camera. Off off sound? Off podcast? Off recording? What, what would you say? What's the terminology there? Uh, whatever works. Off uh, Off the record. Off the record. There you go. Yeah, I should work on that. Um, yeah, like how you know, I was talking here, because I was kind of going through this phase of living in Japan, you know, thinking about leaving for a while and thinking about going to L.A., you know, Los Angeles to, you know, study film and do all this great stuff, because that's where everybody seems to go to, you know, make movies. But you seem pretty against that. So what, what were your reasoning, reasons for those? I went out to L.A. around 2005 to try and work in movies, and it was by far the worst experience I've ever had, professionally speaking. It's a nightmare city of liars and hypocrites and people who will take advantage of you in unspeakable ways. And I, at the time I first met you, I would have not done absolutely anything to avoid getting stuck back in L.A. The irony is now I'm kind of admitting that I may have to go to L.A. myself again to try and make the movies that I want to make. So kind of going back to hell. Oh, really? Yeah, I wouldn't recommend it for anybody who has a way of avoiding it. 
Yeah, well, I was talking to you before we started recording this interview here that I was saying, why don't you just go to New York? I mean, like, they seem like they have a scene there. New York has a scene, but probably not enough to do what I want to do in film. What is it you want to do? Giant surrealist epics. Giant surrealist epics. So they don't have giant surrealist epics in New York. Okay. They don't have them in L.A. either, but there are a few more people who might be more willing in L.A. than in New York. Really? Why, why do you say they're more willing? Uh, mostly based on what some of my professors have suggested about the people they know. Um, hmm. And what some of my friends who work in L.A. as opposed to my one friend who works in New York mm-hmm. uh, has suggested. Oh, okay. But basically my reasoning for going back to some place I can't stand is that I've exhausted all the avenues here and that seems to be the most likely place where those avenues will open again. Yeah, right. Well, I guess, I don't know, that's what everybody tells you is L.A., L.A., I mean, I don't know, because I've had a few people, when I worked at Toons, too, I'd have a few, like, film professors come in. They're like, why don't you go to New York? You know, you seem like more of a New York filmmaker. You probably like it there better. You know, you don't have to use a car to get everywhere. But yeah, I know uh, when I was going to see you Boulder, Spike Lee came and talked to us. And uh, <laughs> I remember this conversation. Oh, yeah, one of the students went up and asked, uh, so... Um, I'm a film student, and I want to work in movies, and the first thing Spike Lee said was, then what the hell are you doing in Colorado? <laughs> well, I mean, some people came out of Colorado. You have, like, Trey Parker, Matt Stone, or is that it? Well, that's the thing. They came out of Colorado. Oh, okay. Well, then, yeah. What well, about Stan Brackage? Stan Brackage stayed in Colorado, but, um, you know, I love his works, but I don't know how many people outside of a very small avant-garde cinema group, no of them. That's true. Hey, I guess for our listeners out there, I'll give uh, give us a plus one if you know who Stan Brackage is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty obscure there. He's worth looking up if you don't. Yeah, no, I mean, I like some of his stuff. I mean, was the whole Criterion Collection made uh, a couple of DVDs on him or something? Yeah, I've actually got the Blu-rays with a film strip signed by Brackage. Oh, really? Package uh, that he gave me. That must be worth there. some money now. Probably because he's he's dead, right? Yeah, he died. I think in two thousand four. Okay. Hmm. Well, is that it? Is there anybody else besides Trey Parker, Matt Stone, Stan Brackage? Uh, Robert Redford Robert lived Redford. here for a while, at least, and I guess oh. he just came back to shoot a Netflix movie. Oh, okay. He was in town for a while. That sounds so cheap, Netflix. You know, it sounds like bottom of the barrel. It's like if Blockbuster made a movie, well, you know? It, it used to be, but Netflix is really taking over. Oh, the, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I know that. <laughs> yeah, I think um, they're actually my business model for what I want to do with uh, just the film industry. The film industry was like Blockbuster. It was this giant monolithic thing that you couldn't deal with. And then something better came along, and Blockbuster died within five years. And I'm hoping to see a similar shift. You mean with Netflix or something? Uh, Well, I'm hoping to do with my stuff what Netflix did for rental. Oh, okay. I I guess I don't quite understand. Um, I don't know if we've talked before about what I want to do with theatrical distribution. No, no, I'd be curious, because I don't know. I don't even know the first step to any of this shit. Basically, I want to replace everything that goes everything. along with Hollywood, and I want to do it from the ground up, meaning having our own theaters, not, you know, it, independent cinema right now means you make a movie and then you try to sell it to one of the big companies because they're the only ones who can get stuff into theaters. So I want to pull the rug out from under them by building our own theaters, our own distribution networks our own studios, and having something that works completely independently of everything that exists today. Well, it seems like it's kind of going in that way anyway. I mean, um, because, you know, they have the whole, uh, what is it? It's Hollywood today. They just sell most of their movies to China, don't they? I'm not too familiar with what they're doing with foreign distribution, though I know it's growing exponentially at the moment. But I don't know the exact avenues of it. That's not something that interests me too much at this phase. What, that uh, they're selling movies overseas? Yeah, um, 
like I've seen the things about how Transformers Four had additional scenes with oh in China yeah with yeah. actors who were popular there and everything. Um, that's not something I'm planning to do with any of my projects. Oh yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I'm just saying that it seems like Hollywood's kind of selling out to the whole world. Like they're always fucking selling out. But I mean, they're always selling out to China and. The really funny thing was a few years ago they did a remake of Red Dawn. Okay, and yeah. And it was going to be China taking over the United States. Mm-hmm. And then China said, no, you can't do that. And Hollywood acquiesced and said, okay, we'll make it North Korea. So basically they couldn't make a movie oh, about... Oh, yeah, that's true. The, I saw that. Yeah, they couldn't make a movie about China taking over the United States because financially speaking, China has already taken over the United States. <laughs> wow, man, wow, how things have changed. Yeah, things changed a lot very recently, too. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know. So how did I even get to know you? I have no memory of this. It's like it was through Sonya at Toons, right? Yeah, I think we had met a few times at Toons when I was there renting various things. I moved into your job after you left. Well, that was like after you helped me with the whole Republican thing and okay. everything. Um, my chronological sense is lacking. Well, that's fine. I, I remember, because I remember I... Sonia like came up to me and she's like, "Hey, there's this one guy I know named Ari, and he wants to make a movie." Now I've like in Colorado, I've had several people come up to me and they like they say, "Yeah, I want to make a movie, man," but they never actually do it. So I was just like, "Yeah, whatever, I, I don't, I don't care." Yeah, sure, bring him in. You know, <laughs> and then he came in. You seem very serious and very cordial about it. So I said, "All right, it seems like fun." Yeah, that was when I was making a movie that was going to be called Day of the Beast. And I recall you lent us some sound equipment for that. And Did I? Things. I just remember it was. I remember we had a problem with the video camera once, and I had to go all the way back to Woodland Park to go pick it. For our audience out there, Woodland Park's like a. How long is that drive from Fountain? Maybe 30, 45 30 minutes. 30 to 40 minutes. That's not that bad. But um, yeah, that was kind of a disaster moment there. But I, I loaned you sound equipment? I have no memory of this. Yeah, uh, you okay. lent us the boom stand and microphone. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah. I forgot I had those. Yeah, they work well. Thank you. Oh, sh- sure. That's fine. But Okay. Yeah, unfortunately, that's the movie that didn't happen. Uh, so I guess, the, you know, all right, yeah, it was a movie that didn't happen because you, what is it, you said you couldn't find any old actors that would want to punch babies or something? <laughs> um, the content for it was somewhat controversial, and basically we had a cast, and then about half of them, kind of incited by one of the actors, all left at the same time about two or three days before filming began. So we compensated ha- for half of it by making two characters twins and shooting them oh, right. on Chris, separate right? sides. Yeah, that was Chris. And then we would shoot the rest of it when we found more actors, but we never found more actors. Oh. So, so it should be called Day of the Beast, the search for more actors. Very space balls. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's my favorite movie. So, okay, well, yeah, it was. So it was just the old guy you needed, and then uh, we needed him and his son. Him and his son, but you couldn't find them. That was basically the what killed the movie. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. No. No. I guess my question here next is: is that like how did you like wh- how did you find out about tunes? Because obviously you you knew Sonya and you got to know me. Um, You're just Toons driving down the street one day, like, hey, what the hell is that? That sort of thing? No, Toons is, I think, it was, I think, older than I was. It had always been there on Nevada, and I think the first time I ever went in there was in high school. Some of my friends in the sci fi club went over there to rent a movie they couldn't find anywhere else. Oh. And I saw it, and it was just like this incredible dark cave movie heaven that Mm-mm. had all of these things that I'd never even heard of. Right, right, right. That's true. Was Sonia still working there at that point, or was there somebody else there? Uh, Sonia hadn't started there at that point. She was working at another video rental place called Skyway Video, which is... Oh, that's right. She did work at Skyway. We'd have these long conversations about that. uh, Did she ever tell you about how she used to have carry porn in uh, the Skyway video, and people used to act really funny about the way they'd ask for porn. <laughs> no, I knew they had a section I wasn't allowed to go in as a kid. I never saw what in it Skyway was. Skyway video? Yeah. Like, what did she tell me these stories about how, 
Like, they'd go in them, and they'd have cameras in there, you know, because they don't want people stealing the tapes. Yeah. Right. Or I guess it wasn't the tapes. It was just the boxes. Mm-hmm. And, like, they'd scratch themselves, like, you know, their junk and everything. And <laughs> uh, what were some of the funny stories? Like, she'd tell me, like, people would come in, and they like, start snooping around. And they'd look, they'd be very, very quiet. And then some of them would have the courage to come up to her and, like, say, do you have any porn? <laughs> like, that sort of thing. Like, people were just desperate, you know? Yeah. I mean, this, a lot of the, the way these customers act, it doesn't work on an audio show. So I can't really demonstrate the, the funny mannerisms some of these guys did. Um, okay, so you found Todd Tunes just it was in the word of word of mouth. So to yeah, say. it was Okay, just one of those main things downtown that everyone went to. Okay. So uh, you uh, you helped a lot with my f- first movie, The Republican, which is uh, has never really been released here because of reasons. Uh, if you want me to go into them, I can. But I was thinking about you know uploading it just to YouTube now. But I was thinking maybe I should do something where I promote it somewhere, or get people excited about seeing it. I don't know. You still want to see it? Yeah, I'd like to see the finished cut. Okay. What 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 would you do with it? Is my question. Since you seem to have more of these. You've been to L.A., you know more about movie people and that sort of thing. I can't speak for Republican because I haven't seen the final cut. Okay. Um, my, I know that I'm hiding all of my really early stuff from CU Boulder. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, like, ashamed of everything that I made before really? uh, 2003. So. Well, you have that one movie that's on your IMDb page, Point Five, is that what it's called? Yeah, that's what happened in 2003. That's okay, but you're proud of that bit. one, right? Yeah, that's the first thing I'm willing to show anybody. Oh, okay. And then Jealous Gods is now the second. The second one? Yeah. Okay. Now, how long is the Jealous Gods? Right now, it's an hour 49. We're hoping to cut it down to an hour 39 by yeah. the end. For the YouTube kids, right? Yep. <laughs> Yeah, no, we, yeah, what is it, Ari was nice enough to show me some of the footage from the beginning of it. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it was interesting, I mean, I like the way it was shot, I mean, you got rid of a lot of the sound problems that were happening in the trailer, and I was a little worried about that. Me I'm too. Like, um, sometimes terrible sound, uh, particularly people on this podcast have mentioned, that it really ruins stuff sometimes. Yeah, it definitely takes the movie down a notch. We had the best sound that we could afford on our budget. Um, and we threw more money into it in post-production, and somebody is taking yet another shot at it now Mm -hmm. during the final edit, but um, nobody's going to compliment the sound quality on it. Right, okay. Well, I mean, uh, what is it? A lot of your movies, particularly like Day of the Beast, because I read your screenplay and that sort of thing, and and, uh, the Jealous God screenplay, you sent it to me. Uh, What was it about that? Oh, you often like to have like a lot of talking in your movies. Do you like, do you like plays that sort of thing? Or no, the reason that the two that you've seen have a lot of talking is because they're the movies that I planned for very low budgets. Oh, okay. So basically, the movies that I'm making now are the talkative ones where uh, that's all you have to shoot. They're one room dramas like Day of the Beast or. Uh, five-room dramas like Jealous Gods, Uh but they're the movies where people talk about everything. The movies, like the adaptation of Valhalla and one called Fall of the Rebel Angels that I have planned for the distant future. Fall of the Rebel Angels. Yeah, that one is a giant surrealist opera version of Paradise Lost with angels and demons and everything and the battle in heaven done in kind of an H.R. Giger, surrealist, Salvador Dali way. All of the language in it is gibberish, basically, that's all sung. Mm-hmm. So I'll prob- hopefully I'll be going from very talkative movies in the beginning to movies in the end that are much more universal that don't even have dialogue in them. Okay. Have you ever seen, a, or not seen, you don't see a, well, I guess you do see a book, technically. But did you ever read? That's what you do with a book. You could see it. But, uh, I love getting into this terminology. But um, uh, did you ever see read? I, man, I gotta self-correct myself here. Read, did you ever read the book *Cat's Cradle* by Kurt Vonnegut? A very, very long time ago. I don't remember much of it. Did um, you enjoy it or not? Really? I remember liking everything I read by Vonnegut. 
Okay. But if you asked me to name a single character right now, I don't think I could anymore. Okay, because like a lot of like I was checking out your book because oh by the way our for our audience out there Ari is also a pretty big author. I'd say that what he's known best for is uh, his writing. Or at least you go on Google, type in Ari Bach, and he's got tons of stuff on uh, his books. But anyway, so my question here is is that uh, Kurt Vonnegut he often makes a lot of he made that book Kurt. Uh, Cat's Cradle, and they use a lot of terminology. Like, your book seems to have, like, their, its own sort of language, it's gibberish, um, that sort of thing. Like, because the religion in the book's called Bokonanism, if you remember. Vaguely. <laughs> Vaguely. Yeah, anyway, it's just, it reminds me totally of that. But he does it more in a kind of a satirical, kind of comedic, Well, I think yours is more serious. I hope not. Uh, <laughs> All right, good, good, good. funny. Okay. All right. Maybe maybe it's just me. Maybe I take things too seriously. Yeah, the uh, the entire fact blog actually started out of reject jokes from the Valhalla books. Oh, and from a web comic I did called the Snail Factory. Right. Well, I remember we've had conversations before where you told me that some of the ideas for your movies came from like ideas from like Simpsons episodes or something like that, or Family Guy episodes. <laughs> There's one movie project I want to do about. Uh, a school that's based lo- very loosely on a Treehouse of Horror episode. Uh, just the concept from it got adapted and changed. So it's more of a serious movie, but the con- the horror concept behind it was from Simpsons. Okay. Well, I, yeah, sometimes I'm inspired by those as well. Like, I, What was that movie that came out? Chappie. Did you see Chappie? Yeah. The one about the robot who... It's like short circuit, but the R-rated short circuit. Yeah. (laughs) I I remember they brought it to Japan, Mm -hmm. and they completely edited it. Like, they they made it so it could be for kids. So they tried to make, like, Chappie all cute and everything, and, like, take out all the gore and all the violence and stuff. Did you see the movie? Yeah, I've got it. I've got all of... uh, Oh, you liked it? Yeah, I've got all of Blomkamp's movies. Um, Okay. God only knows if I pronounced his name correctly. Yeah, right. Um, but District 9, I thought, was pretty good, though it had a monumentally stupid moment where he steals the ship. Uh, Elysium, I thought, was the best sci-fi movie since Avatar, honestly. Really? And then Chappie is not my favorite of his movies, but it had some really brilliant sci-fi concepts in it. Oh, I should I should explain. that Somebody went on Twitter... They mentioned, he was like, did you know your movie's edited in Japan? And he's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, my movie's edited in Japan? <laughs> you know? And that gave me an idea for, like, a screenplay. Like, saying, well, what if somebody brought something over to Japan just so they could edit it? You know? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's how these stories come out. Because I mean, they often say, like, in film school where you go to, like, you study screenplays or whatever. And they always tell you, don't regurgitate stuff you just saw on TV. You know? Mm-hmm. Have you ever taken any screenplay classes or read any of those books or whatever? Um, I've looked over a few screenwriting books, uh, and it's been addressed in some of my film classes. I've never taken a strictly screenwriting class. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of the so-called rules of screenwriting I have no appreciation for. Um, Quote-unquote rules? Yeah, there, there's one book, uh, I forget the name of the guy, but they uh, had him in adaptation. Oh, Robert McKee? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's got these this Bible of screenwriting, and I disagree with probably 90% of what I remember. Oh, from really? It. I like that book. <laughs> it teaches you how to make a normal movie. I right. have no interest in making normal movies whatsoever. Mm-hmm. What is it you hate about normal movies? I don't hate normal movies. I, okay. I go to see all of the Marvel movies. I love Doctor Strange. Right. But that's not what I want to make. I want to make stuff like Unchen Andalu, the Benwell movie. Okay. Um, Something a little more unconventional. Yeah, really bizarre, surreal stuff. Uh, I don't know if you've seen my drawings. And yeah, yeah, everything. yeah. It's, he has a DeviantArt page you can find on Google as well. Yeah, I want to make movies that look like that. Yeah, I, I really got my cyber stalking game down on lock this time. Nice. <laughs> so, <laughs> I hope you didn't find anything too horrible about me. No, no, it's it's fine. I mean, that's not what an interviewer is supposed to do. They're supposed to like do their research about. Otherwise, you just look like a dickhole, you know. <laughs> yeah, the uh, 
one interviewer who interviewed me about the movie knew absolutely nothing about it or me or anything. Um, was that frustrating? She, yeah, because she didn't know what she was there to interview me about. She didn't even know that I was... Like, she knew that I was making a movie, and that's it. <laughs> Do you like movies, she, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Those she, kind of questions. She actually did ask that. Um, <laughs> oh, my God. And it was a very awkward and impatient interview. It sounds like it. Yeah, so one thing I've noticed about you, because you know, we live in different countries. I live in Japan. You live in uh, the U.S. of A., Colorado, where we are right now. And you do a lot of stuff on Tumblr. Now, I've never really gotten into Tumblr. Um, I guess I should ask, why, why Tumblr? I kind of fell into it um, back when Tumblr was fairly young, I think around 2010. Um, the person I was with at the time and I were just enjoying all of the weird things on the internet. Mm -hmm. And we noticed that as time went on, more and more of those weird things were coming from the same blogging platform, which was Tumblr. Yeah. So eventually I started one to collect all of the oddness. And then I started facts as just a joke for joke rejects from other projects. And suddenly I woke up and that had like 500 followwers overnight. And I was like, wow, apparently this is popular. So I... You think it was just from tags is the way they found you? No, it was uh, my few followers. I think I had like 50 followers by then. Um, and then once Fact started, it got 10 times that on its first day. And then mm -hmm. over the next couple of years, it got up to about 100,000. Mm -hmm. So it's a it became a good platform to advertise my books and projects on. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Well, yeah, because I've never got into it. I mean, it seems like a lot of people like it because they have lots of gifts and images and nostalgia. What's that guy? The guy on the internet. You know the nostalgia critic? I've heard of him. I haven't seen his He stuff. made, like, one on, uh, how the fuck, what's that movie? Demolition Man. Yeah. And they said, Demolition Man, it's like a Tumblr page. Because <laughs> everybody talks about how they love all this stuff, and they put it on this Tumblr page. Like Taco Bell... Uh, Oscar Mayer Wiener, that sort of thing. You've seen Tem Demolition Man, right? Yeah, I've got that too. Okay, yeah. I'm. So, oh, by the way, for our folks at home, surrounded by all these movies, you know, this is an audio show. So, yeah. How many movies do you have? About two thousand. About two thousand. Maybe a couple hundred of those are TV series DVDs. Mm. So those are by season. Um, yeah, I stopped collecting just because I just don't have room for it. My girlfriend gets mad at me for buying too much stuff so yeah i think this is an example of having space and filling that space to match hmm. like i've heard uh that people's trash output if you if they have uh if they pay for trash to be taken away mm -hmm. then they throw out very little but if they have a free dumpster and garbage service then they start expelling huge amounts of everything so really? I'm, I'm not sure what the term is for that but we we move we grow to fill the space we're in like that thing from harry potter and fantastic beasts or whatever it's called oh. um we that's, expand yeah, based on how much space we have to expand in that's very true you got, I, i've always looked at it sort of like as the goldfish theory What's you that? know like if you know like if you have a goldfish and if you have a big aquarium, they'll get bigger. But if yeah. you have a tiny aquarium, they'll just stay that same exactly. size. Exactly. I think video collections are the same way. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, because I mostly moved on. Because like, I, I love looking at my nice collections. Because I have a, one friend in Tokyo named Yoshiki, and he has like this huge, like, video collection. It's just like it's a mansion of just videos and vi d DVD tapes. I'm like, <laughs> I'd love to have that. But at the same time, it gets to the point where sometimes I'm picking through my collection and I don't want so much, or I don't know. I'm pretty fickle about it. But this seems well organized. It's organized by standards that I can understand. I know most people go in and, like, if they're looking for a specific movie, they have no clue where to even start. But basically everything that can be by director is by director, and everything else is pretty much random. Oh. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, 
Because like, I like collecting coffee mugs and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Like, the more I, like, watch people on the internet, like, successful people, like, well, the few people I watch, like, this guy named Renegade Cut and another guy named Markiplier who plays video games online. I've heard of him. Yeah. Um, they don't collect stuff. You know, and they're, they're constantly producing shit. Like, they're really prolific. Mm. I'd like to get to that stage where I'm, like, making stuff nonstop, hand over fist. But I'm wondering, is, like, most of my time going to my collecting and less time going to my actual producing? I don't know. Maybe I worry about it too much. Uh, um, I'm hoping that someday I'll be making movies constantly and have no time for anything else. Yeah, right. Um, well, speaking of movies, you seen any good movies lately? Um... Not in theaters, no. No? No. <laughs> yeah, it was. My mom wanted to take me to see Jackie or something. I'm just not interested in seeing any movies anymore. I don't know why that is. It's like TV shows I watch now. I like watch like Mr. Robot or... Um, I've heard that's good. Game of Thrones or... I like Game of Thrones. Um, Bread or Call Saul. Whatever's still on the air. So I watch that kind of stuff. But like, nowadays, you just I like, watch movies and... I don't know. I mean, it's just like it's hard for me to watch them because I, I, I sort of I've read so many screenplay books now. And it's like I know, like okay, this is Act One, and this is Act Two, and then this is Act Three. And I guess I only really do that when I'm really bored when I'm watching a movie. I don't know if you ever do that. But. Kind of. Um, all right. So you being a jack of all trades, you know, kind of a writer, filmmaker, illustrator. You would say you're best known for you know writing books, right? Yeah, the Valhalla series. Yeah. Okay, well, hold on, hold on, let me fix this mic here. The Valhalla series? Yes. Okay. I mean, like, yeah, like, I look on Amazon, like, you all rave reviews. I don't see, like, one negative one. It's got some negative ones, uh, especially the sequels where things get a bit more bizarre, but I'm really happy with how people have received it so far. Okay. How did you get on IMDb? Uh, point five, my first short film was actually theatrically released. Mm-hmm and IMDb puts up anything that's theatrical. Okay. So uh, Jealous Gods is going to be theatrical as well. Yes. We're going to be applying to all the major film festivals. Okay. Okay, that about wraps things up. I want to thank all of you for listening today. Remember, you can find Ari's movie in the links down below. Remember, you can if you need more information about anything, absolutely anything... You know, everything is down in that description. You should go take a look at it. It's pretty hot. Um, I mean, if you're listening to this on iTunes, then, um, well, that, there's an iTunes description. And uh, remember, if you're helping this show, you're helping me pay the bills with uh, putting this odd podcast on a website. Because putting it on iTunes, you actually have to pay for it. So, And, I mean, I love having it on iTunes. I mean, it makes it nice and easy to listen to. You know, and if I were, you know, subscribed to the Why Come Japan podcast, I'd love to have it on iTunes. So that out of the way, I want to thank you all for listening once again. And of course, we'll see you next time. <laughs>